year presented by the New Orleans Tourism and Cultural Fund. Give yourselves a big hand for being here as well as the New Orleans Tourism and Cultural Fund. Um, uh, this is the only festival in Louisiana dedicated to Louis Armstrong. Are there any other Louis Armstrong festivals in the world? Uh, there's the Louis Armstrong Continuum, thrown by our friends, the Louis Armstrong Educational Foundation. I see Jackie Harris here. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. um, uh, other than that, I think that's the okay, only games so, in town. Well, it's the only one in Louisiana. It says right true. on this piece of paper. <laughs> and it's produced by the French Quarter Festival Incorporated, a nonprofit organization showcasing New cultural heritage since 1984. Now, is uh, this festival is made possible through the generosity of our sponsors and supported through uh, your purchase of official festival merchandise and delicious beverages. So take some time out of the air conditioning and go get yourself uh, a glass of Corbell. <laughs> I, uh, that, I, I saw that on the sign. Um, and uh, I'm, I might get one of those hats because I'm bald and, you know, it will cover my head in the sun, which is good. Um, anyway, you find yourself at the... The Satchmo Legacy stage, and this is in memory of Joni Berry. Joni, uh, she was a dancer and dance advocate um, and a philanthropist. She was a great friend of the festival. She passed away a few years ago. Um, uh, and it is sponsored by the Joseph K. and Inez Eichenbaum Foundation, which um, was run by Joni. And uh, uh, Mr. Stephen Maitland Lewis is here, um, who um, uh, is... Uh, representing the foundation as a great friend of this festival. Give him a big hand of applause. <laughs> also, the Ella Fitzgerald Charitable Foundation. Oh, yeah. Give them a big hand of applause. Yeah, yeah. And watching from what city in New Jersey? Mawa. Mawa, New Jersey. <laughs> Richard and Vicki Norigan. Give them a big hand of applause. <laughs> In uh, 2008, I was the curator of this part of the festival, and uh, um, uh, I noticed that uh, um, uh, the, the people were older who were presenting. And I said, there has to be some young, strapping young person <laughs> who, who knows about Louis Armstrong. And I come across a, um, uh, a blog called uh, dippermouth.blogspot.com, and, uh, and it was very enthusiastic. And, Smart and funny, and uh, and so I, I I called my friend Dan Morgenstern, and I said, uh, well, Do you know about this Ricky Riccardi guy? And he said, Get him. He has films I've never seen. <laughs> so I did. That was in 2008. Uh, in 2009, he uh, the, you know few people actually have their actual real dream job, <laughs> and he has that. He started working for the Lewis House uh, Lewis Armstrong House Museum. He's written two books, just turned in a third. Um, and he has been here and has been like kind of the centerpiece for 15 years now. And I just want to give you one anecdote. On the first time he was here, he did films at the end of each day. And on the third day, he got a standing ovation. And his <laughs> wife was crying in the front row. And he's, <laughs> it was really one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. So give a big hand to <laughs> Ricky Riccardi. <laughs> Now, I don't know, uh, you know, I mentioned Don and the pandemic. You know, during the pandemic, Ricky, if you follow him, he was uh, uh, curating uh, a series of um, a website, uh, That's My Home, about uh, Louis Armstrong, and it still continues. Still going, yeah. Yeah, and he did that uh, during the pandemic. Now, during the pandemic, uh, uh, Ms. Maxine Gordon, give her a big hand of applause. <laughs> um, she uh, had a special dispensation to travel to France, Provence in particular, <laughs> uh, uh, from the French government because of uh, it was a special cultural visa uh, to work on her book uh, that is forthcoming called Quartet, Stories from the Lives of Four Women Jazz Musicians, Maxine Sullivan, Velma Middleton, Melba Liston, and Shirley Scott. Um, and that is going to be published jointly by Columbia University and Howard University Press. Now her last book, a, a biography of her late husband, uh, sophisticated Giant, The Life and Legacy of Dexter Gordon, uh, won many awards, including uh, uh, the uh, ASCAP Dan Deems Taylor <laughs> Award for Biography. Um, 
She is a jazz advocate, uh, educator, writer. Uh, she runs, uh, she's project director of Women Who Listen, an oral history project with women jazz fans. She's been doing that since 2005. Also, I have to get this right. This guy knows, I'm sure. Oh, the yeah. Harvard hat on, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, she is a Radcliffe Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Harvard <laughs> University. I give you Ricky Riccardi and Maxine Gordon. Yay. <laughs> Hello, Maxine. Hi, Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> We're back again. Uh -huh. uh, we just figured out seven years in a row. We even did a Zoom uh, during COVID oh, together. Oh, yeah, when your book. To keep the streak the going. The second book came out with the train. Yes, yeah. yes, indeed. Um, well, you guys are going to hear way too much of me <laughs> over the weekend, so I'm just going to say, Maxine, why don't you take it away? <laughs> and tell Already? Us, Already, okay. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I'd like to begin by thanking Satchmo Fest, of course, and Ricky, because um, what's the first year I came? 2016. Right. After that, every year I think of some other reason... <laughs> <laughs> to come, oh, we could talk about this. So I would send an email to Ricky, how about this idea? And he usually likes my ideas, which is a little <laughs> unusual. And then I got invited back. So I want to thank him, as always, because on this subject of Ilma Middleton, I, I thank Ricky Riccardi because I've told this <laughs> story many times. But when I was doing the research on the Dexter Gordon biography, Dexter Gordon worked with Louis Armstrong in 1944. So he always wanted in the outline for his book a chapter on Louis Armstrong. And so I didn't know really much then about Louis Armstrong as much as I should have known. And so then I contacted Ricky, probably, email probably, or phone. Uh, I think it was email first. Email, yeah. okay. And I said, could I come out to the archive and do you have anything on Dexter Gordon? And he said, we don't have anything in the index, but we could look at 1944 and see if there's anything you could use. So he pulled out 1944, <laughs> and there was a photo of Dexter in the Louis Armstrong band. He's sitting in the end, and of course he's very recognizable, and he had big feet, and he sat at the end. and. <laughs> And he was only 21 at the time. And so that, you know, began my research about him and who was in the band and, and that. And then I said to him, well, who's the singer in the white dress? And I never forget the look, because if you're a jazz fan, and you know sometimes you say something like, oh, who's the piano player? And they give you the look like, <laughs> you. Don't, how could you ask that stupid question? You know, <laughs> he gave me the look, but he's polite. And he was like, well, that's Velma. That's Velma Middleton. And I was like, okay, <laughs> good. And, you know, I wrote it down as a note. And then slowly I became, uh, well, obsessed is negative, so I, I call it very interested in Velma. And when I was finishing the Dexter Gordon biography, something happens if you've written a book where the next book you know, wants to be written. And so if you, you, know, you kind of hear the voices. And so I heard Velma say, what about me? What about me? <laughs> and the other three women also, you know, I'd had thought about, you know, why isn't anybody writing about these people, you know? And so, but especially Velma, yeah. and she um, is sorely overlooked. I mean, or was. She's not anymore because we don't allow her to be overlooked. Okay, so um, about this talk, well, we call it the final tour because she died, in fact, on this tour in Sierra Leone, Africa. This is a tour, three month tour of Africa, Louis Armstrong, 1960. The first part is sponsored by Pepsi Cola in West Africa and then the State Department. And um, it was grueling. You'll sh we'll show you the, mm -hmm. the itinerary. But um, I, you know, it sounds like, you know, I, when I'm writing about her, it's not, you know, she died, she was going to be 44, so she was 43, we think. 
And <laughs> so then it could be like, you know, oh, another tragic, a jazz story, but it's not tragic, okay? Because she started working when she was 13. So, you know, it's not like she didn't have a long career, successful career. She was uh, 20, almost 20 years with Louis Armstrong. She went all over the world. They were, you know, very close. She and he had the beautiful relationship. So, and she had a good life. She had a happy life. Like my late husband said, you know, Anybody who knows me, you know, will not cry when I die because I had a good life, and you know, <laughs> it's, uh, I live longer than most of my friends. So um, she, I, do, I don't want that her to, you know, to tragic be the tragic figure, yeah. ending, but um, I want to tell the story about the tour. So, okay, I'm supposed to keep this brief, but so, okay, I was at Radcliffe at Harvard. Are you a Harvard man? Somebody waved at me at Harvard. Okay. Um, with this fellowship for 10 months. And I want, went to the map division. Scott, what's it? Oh, God. I want to thank the guy in the map division, Scott Walker. Um, somebody said, you know, this is Harvard. They have a map. <laughs> they have a whole, like, maps from, like, forever, maps. So I went to the map division of the PUC library and I said, you know, I have this idea about jazz geography. I want to map the, the, these four women from their birth and then, you know, maybe pick up on a tour. And I always had in mind this tour of Africa to look, because it's one thing to look at an itinerary and then they list, oh, date and location. Well, well, we don't know where this, or I mm -hmm. don't know where this is, and I was a road manager, so I do know something about geography in Europe, but the Africa tour is when you see. So the, um, the map person at Harvard, he said, oh, you know, uh, that's an interesting project. Yeah, I, I like to work on that, which was, you know, very rewarding that somebody didn't think I had a bad idea. <laughs> and so we have maps that he, is worked on with me on the tour. And then on another uh, part of the book, on Melba Liston, there's a tour with Dizzy, they call Middle East Tour in 1956, so we're ma I'm mapping that. And then I'm mapping on all of them, like where they're born, and then what that's about, because uh, Velma is born in Holdenville, Oklahoma, and that's a sundown town. And which, if you don't know what a sundown town is, that means black people could not go out after dark. And if they did and they were shot, it wasn't against the law. So that's, she comes from that to end her life on a, having a stroke on a three month tour with Louis Armstrong in Africa. So there's some kind of, to me, a meaning of, you know, a person's life is like, I mean, I don't know if it's predestined, but she had a big life. She had a big life. So, okay. So far, we, so good. You got it now, right? Well, we're going to do the maps. What, or are we going to, you want to, do you want to read about Africa in 1960? I know you have You your, want me to say more about the tour? Uh, keep going. Take okay, another what's, quote. What, what do we have I've got first. the maps lined up. Okay. Okay. So, do you want me to list the... Do we, do we list the itinerary? I do have the itinerary, yeah, a little bit later on. But okay. We could just show, you know, we'll show the first map here, which covers the first two weeks of the tour. I think, um, do we have the personnel? Because I wanted to be Oh, yeah, sure. all right. And so we'll, we'll, we'll jump around here. Okay, but let, let's. You know, let's, he, all right. I just want to start with who was on the tour. It's a three-month tour. There were 12 people traveling together almost every day. There were a few places that they stayed more than one day, mm -hmm. which we show on the map. But th this is, can we, can they see it clearly? Well, okay. I'll tell you what it is. This okay. is a State Department memo listing everybody that was gonna go on the trip. So this was organized back, I'll go back here. This is June 28th, 1960. This is a letter sent by Associated Booking, uh, Joe Glazer's office to Dr. Alexander Schiff, who was Louis Armstrong's road doctor from 1953 to the end of his life. And this was when it was still just kind of being set in motion. And so there's a list of the countries they were gonna visit. If you want an idea of Louis Armstrong's life, the page on the right there is his itinerary 
uh, just for a couple of months from July through September of 1960. So when you hear these things about one-nighters, this is it. This was Armstrong just turned 60 years old, literally traveling every night. And then there's handwritten on the bottom there when they're going to go to uh, Africa in October. Dr. Schiff, being a doctor, he was also in charge of the immunizations. So they had to get shots. Um, yeah, Typhoid, smallpox, all of that. Everybody had to get their vaccines. We actually have the bass player, Mort Herbert's uh, immunization record and the band boy. Um, Leroy Thomas, his records so of all of them had to get all the vaccines. And then this is Doc Schiff's date book. He's got nothing through October, but this whole tour begins there about October 12th, mm -hmm. and it is completely filled night by night, city by city. There's a month off in December where they filmed Paris Blues. So everybody got to take a quote unquote vacation in Paris for a month and then go right back to Africa in January. Uh, into February of 1961. At the end of January, the famous photos of Lewis and the Great Sphinx of Giza in Egypt, those were taken on January 28th. Um, but then just to show you the, the cast of characters here, of course, we have Lewis and Lucille, um, who actually celebrated their wedding anniversary in London on the way over to um, uh, Ghana. And three figures uh, you don't hear too much about, but they were kind of crucial. The man on the left, is Pierre Frenchy Tallery. He was the road manager, uh, one of the most despised figures. Why, <laughs> in why the, is that? They oh, they, they hated that. him. Yeah, Lewis called him Simon Legree. Oh. Uh, yeah, no, he, he was kind of Joe Glazer's spy. So oh. he was there to make sure, you know, the people Lewis was talking to, the people who were backstage. If he saw something he didn't like, he would call Glazer. Glazer would call Lewis. And so nobody really trusted Frenchy. But he was the one who was in charge of getting the band where they needed to go, uh -huh. you know, the road manager life. The man in the middle is Dr. Alexander Schiff. Um, like I said, he, if you watch any boxing matches from Madison Square Garden in the 50s and 60s, there's a good chance you will hear the ringside physician is Dr. Oh. Alexander Schiff. All the Muhammad Ali fights, Emil Griffith, Sugar Ray Robinson, okay. that was his day job, but Joe Glazer paid him to travel, so Lewis always had a doctor. And the man on the right is Hayes' Doc Pugh. He was Lewis's valet from the mid-40s until his passing in the mid-60s. Uh, Doc Pugh was the gatekeeper. If you wanted to get to Lewis in his dressing room, you had to know Doc Pugh. You had to talk to Doc Pugh. Uh, multiple people told me Doc Pugh had all the secrets. He, you know, he knew what Lewis needed to get through his day, all that stuff. They all look very tired in these photos. <laughs> <laughs> so not, not an easy job um, being on the road, never mind playing the trumpet, but just okay. traveling 300 nights a year, not oh, easy. Okay, so uh, Ricky found, because I knew that these three people had also traveled, there's one we don't have a picture of. We Leroy Thomas, band yeah, boy. the band boy, we don't have a picture. Um, but Ricky, of course, found photos of these people because, you know, we always hear, oh, the band, you know, uh, the band traveled, but I just wanted to be sure we know who was in the band also. So we have Velma who was born September 1st, 1917, and dies February 10th, 61, born in Holdenville, Oklahoma, okay? And she was with the Louis Armstrong Orchestra and then the All Stars. You notice they're all hyphen stars. It always varies, yeah. Yeah, All <laughs> Stars, from 42 to 61. And then you have Barney Bagard, whose name was Albany, or Albany? Yeah, Albany. Yeah. Albany <laughs> Leon Begard, born 19, March 3rd, 1906, in New Orleans, died 1980. He was with the All-Stars 1947 to 55, and then 60 to 61. And then you have Trummy Young, now born James Osborne Young, trombone, January 12, 1912 to September 10th, 1984, born in Savannah, Georgia, with Louis Armstrong, 1952 to 1964. When people had a gig, they tend to stay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, these were road warriors. <laughs> right? Um, and then Billy Kyle was William Osborne Kyle, Jr., piano, July 14th, 1914, to February 23rd, 1966, born in Philadelphia. Also died on the road. Yeah, right, yeah. right. And then the bass player is Mort Herbert, Herbert Pelovis Morton, bass, June 30th, 1925 to June 5th, 1983, born in Somerville, New Jersey, and he's white. 
So this is very interesting because they did, could not go to South Africa and they did not come to New Orleans they for 10 years. That whole time. And yeah. I know we did it on purpose. Oh, the, the integrated band. Oh, yeah. did it on yeah, purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have photos of him. And then there's Danny Barcelona, Daniel Plaga Barcelona drums, July 23rd, 1929 to April 1st, 2007, born in Waipahu, Hawaii, <laughs> I don't know if I'm saying it right, of Filipino-American descent. And he was with the Armstrong All-Stars, 1958 to 1971. Yeah. So, you know, I, yeah. I, we, you know, we're always looking at Louis Armstrong, but we, you know, these people, when you travel like that, you know, that group, yeah. there are no secrets, okay? No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was a road manager. You, I'll never tell what I know. <laughs> but, you know, it, to think of them going to Africa and what he said about being in Africa when he saw the woman that looked like his, his mother, mother yeah. you know, they, they're, they're never going to be the same right. person they were before because think about what was happening in this country when they're in Africa when you look at the pictures and he's like a king in Africa and then he come back here where you know can't go in the front door so yeah okay onward well this, this is <laughs> so now you know about the band this is an offstage photo this was taken in Houston the woman sitting there apparently was one of Lewis's cousins her name is Louise uh, Beaudreau I have not um done the genealogy to see exactly a uh, cousin on whose side but she hosted Lewis and the All-Stars when they were passing through Houston and so yeah Danny Barcelona Mort Herbert standing Trummy Young in the middle Barney Bigard Billy Kyle standing and Lewis in the middle uh, just wanted to show it off stage because you know this band was like a family you know they're performing every night but they also are eating together uh, they're on the bus you know what staying the the hotel. oh yeah no there's great photos from this gathering red beans and rice and everything uh, and of course, a photo of the band on stage. This is during one of the stops of the tour. You'll see Lewis wearing uh, traditional African garb. He came out and kind of surprised the audience. But in the background is a big uh, Pepsi Cola logo. And as Maxine mentioned, the first part of this tour was actually sponsored by Pepsi. They were opening uh, bottling plants mm -hmm. in Nigeria and Ghana, and they thought it would be fun to have Lewis Armstrong uh, kind of be the spokesperson. And um, Boy, if there, was, if there was ever a spokesperson, I know. <laughs> Jackie, call Lisa. We got to get a Pepsi deal. <laughs> I mean, it, it already. You know, we should get them. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, right? the, the ads write, write themselves. But, you know, Lewis was happy to, to sponsor that portion. And Pepsi, you know, they, they set him up. You know, this is um, Lewis in Nigeria meeting Sir Amadou Bello, uh, the premier of northern Nigeria. Velma in the background is kind of reacting. You can see her. Um, and covering her face. We actually have a beautiful color snapshot of this moment. And uh, the other man standing there in the glasses on the other side of Lewis is the Emir of Kano. We actually have his guards here. We, uh, we know this because Pepsi, they put this stuff out as press releases. So they're the Royal Guards of the Emir of Kano pictured in the palace courtyard. So, mm. you know, they're looking pretty serious. But, you know, once people meet Louis Armstrong, <laughs> they all uh, have a good time. Uh, so that was the Pepsi portion. And then um, Maxine found this photo of um, Velma. Thanks, Ricky. Yeah. <laughs> One that I had not seen before with Louis, uh, obviously, I guess, in, in the Cameroon uh, portion of the tour. But I think I should go back. We should talk about the Congo because that's become the most famous um, Another photo Maxine found of Lewis arriving in the Congo. And should we show the newsreel? Yeah. All right. Uh, this is newsreel footage, Associated Press, that was shown in movie theaters of Armstrong arriving in Leopoldville. This is the famous story when the Civil War was going on and both sides called a truce because Armstrong was there. Um, there's more to that story. We'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> One of America's most popular emissaries gets a warm reception as he arrives in the troubled Congo on a State Department-sponsored Goodwill mission. Louis Sanchmo Armstrong, whose golden trumpet has preached the gospel of New Orleans jazz on every continent, arrives in truly royal style. outraged Radio Moscow, which blasted Armstrong's visit as a diversionary tactic, a left-handed tribute to a mellow cat, 
the Congolese find right on the beam. Now, it's interesting that the newsreel mentions that uh, Russia was saying this was a diversionary tactic because this is something that came back. This was a big article that kind of exploded a year or two ago uh, where um, there's been recent research showing that basically Lewis kind of was a Trojan horse, that him showing up and stopping the war was um, for the CIA to do their thing with Lumumba and everything going on in, in the background. And um, Maxine, do you have any comments, uh, commentary on this yeah, aspect? I have. <laughs> I I, you know, I, I got it's there's a book. It's called uh, White Menace. Is that what's uh, it's a British Malice. 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 Yeah. Yep. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yes. But uh, what I object to is uh, saying, assuming that Louis Armstrong is duped, because <laughs> I don't think you could dupe Louis Armstrong. So the fact that the CIA was in Africa, that's a fact. We, we, we know that, you know, the, the countries that had oil, you know that, they, of course, the government is involved. And but so there's a picture of him with somebody who's later identified as CIA. But to me, let's not think that he's not aware of he's being used by the government to represent something that maybe isn't exactly true about the U.S. because, of course, they're using it as propaganda that, you know, the U.S., oh, you know, they love black people and they love music and, you know, he represents something that when he goes back, of course, he does not. Right. So um, there's a tendency to me, maybe I'm overly sensitive about Louis Armstrong, to, like, undermine, his, first of all, his intelligence and his, his obvious knowledge of, you know, being used, but I mean, who's being used, right? Mm. Because it paid really well. Yeah. You know, the band made a lot of money on that tour. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's like when we look at the record business, you know, they're underpaid, but then they use those recordings to get more gigs where they got paid. You know, it's like, it's complicated, right? And so. the funny thing is Lewis had avoided uh, State Department tours for years. Like a lot of people assume that every time he went overseas was State Department, ambassador of goodwill. But no, he inspired the State Department's involvement. Uh, his tour in 55, the Ambassador Satch tour, was picked up by Edward R. Murrow and New York Times and everything. And that inspired Adam Clayton Powell right, and the government exactly. to start the program. But they didn't choose Lewis first. They chose right. Dizzy. Right. And then once Lewis spoke out against Little Rock, you know, they... <laughs> yeah, they kept moved, him quiet. They for kept, a yeah, for a few years, uh -huh. uh, and we have a, a tape at the archives where he's, you know, off stage uh, complaining. So the people want me to go on these government tours because I'm not going to talk and do this for the government. So send John Foster Dulles to do the talking. I just want to play the trumpet. Um, but he changed his mind for this tour, and, and and I think he did know, you know, why and what was happening. But you know, not everybody gets to stop a war uh, for whatever the reasons every day, <laughs> and so he did remain proud for of one that. Day. Yeah, that's so, so great. So here's so Lewis. Great. Here's Lewis on the Mike Douglas show in 1970, reminiscing about that, and then he actually talks a little bit about his reception in Africa, and uh, he brings us back to Velma. You know, he went to he he went to, he went to Nigeria seriously, and they stopped the war to honor his run. Yeah, show the picture. Here's what happened. Sure, yeah. I'm serious. And. Now there That's, he is. Look at this. They stopped the war and put him up there. You know what that is? He's like a king there. That's you? Leopoldville. Yeah. Yeah. Man, we was... came off that ferry, and then we we got in automobile and uh, no more shooting, and then they, they paraded all through the city. And, and the day of the concert, they put me on this chair. And you know, you got to be somebody to ride in that chair. Yeah. <laughs> Did you do, when they put you That's in that chair? Better than old rocking chair. There. <laughs> Did you know what they were going to do when they put you in that chair? Did you get scared at all while you were over there? With my people? <laughs> all they know. <laughs> you all they know. About old Satchimo all through the jungles. Did they call that the way they called you? All through the jungle, Satchimo. You put it. <laughs> Lucille, your wife said that you, she said that you, now the concert he mentioned, uh, and, and it was in Leopoldville. Leopoldville. There were 100,000 people showed up that came right. out of the jungles to hear this man. You could walk on heads for five blocks and never fall. Really? <laughs> they were standing so close. Walk on heads. 
Just a wall of flesh. And uh, the Velma Middleton, you know, the kind of stout girl I had singing yeah. and well stocked up. Uh, anyway, yes. <laughs> she goes into a dance, and at that time, we'd be playing that 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 and she'd make a split Sam, and all them Africans was rushing to the, the bandstand they got so excited so the commander said go into sleepy time down south right quick <laughs> and uh, let me say yeah, Lewis remained proud we have scrapbooks he made an entire scrapbook devoted to this tour and so here's some of his um, you know, him cutting out these clippings, Wizard Satchmo Unites the Congo, uh, and then, you know, his collages in the middle there, Africa, 1961. Uh, and another thing he saved, uh, a tape he was given in the Congo of all tributes that were written to him. Here's uh, dedicated by the people of Congo to the <laughs> Satchmo. And so here's one of them uh, that he also saved uh, in a scrapbook page. Bonjour, Okuka, greetings, Okuka. And I have... Um, uh, a translation that was sent to me, and I'll just play a, a minute of this. Yeah, one of the good old good ones. <laughs> um, but I, I do, I do want to play um, a little bit of Lewis and the All Stars. So about two years ago, we got a call at the Armstrong Archives. Actually, it was an email first. Guy did not put his name on it, and he said, "Listen, he said I worked. I, I was in the army. We were in the Ivory uh, Ivory Coast. Lewis and the All Stars came in, I think, early December 1960, and we were told beforehand, do not record this show. You know, it's recording is forbidden." And he said, "Well, we set up our recorder. <laughs> we 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 secretly hid the microphone and we recorded the whole set. And he goes, I have the tape. I want to donate the tape." And then I said, that's wonderful. This is great. And I said, you know, can I send you a thank you letter? You know, w w what should I put in the record? He's like, don't mention my name. This was 60 years later. I still don't know his name, but he recorded it. And it turned out to be it's the last recording we have of Velma. Um, because after this concert, they went to Paris for the month. Last year, we played the Paris recordings. Uh -huh. But soon after, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But here's a beautiful montage of photos by the late Herb Snitzer taken in June of 1960, just to show Velma in action. But here's the first, um, it's like an eight minute performance. I'm just gonna play the first two minutes of St. Louis Blues, the W.C. Handy classic. And um, it's poignant, you know, Velma talking about loving that man till the day she dies. Um, this is about two months before her passing. <laughs> The W.C. Handy St. Louis Blues, sung by our vocalist, Velma Middleton. I hate to see. Evening sun go down Say so I hate to see That evening sun go down It makes me feel like I'm on my last go round If I'm feeling too much 
tomorrow Just like I feel today Ho, ho, ho Feeling tomorrow Like I feel today Gonna pack my trunk Make my getaway You know, extract like that and other things. She did a lot of features. That's right. the thing, yeah. Okay. There's more. Maybe I, our next we'll, we'll, we'll take this conversation okay. off stage. <laughs> because she doesn't have her own album. No. And that would be good for people to hear, and, you know. And she recorded two singles as a leader yeah, in yeah. the 50s. We, we could use her. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we we, gotta, have, we have an idea. Next do. year, yeah. we'll be back next year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to show you how grueling this tour was, I mean, you know, we're about to approach the tragic end of Velma, but Lewis at one point, um, here's an article, uh, this is towards the end of the Paris day where there is Dr. Alexander Schiff. So Lewis had to rest because he was dealing with exhaustion. And then we have a tape where Lewis talks about how at one point, Trump Young showed up with a doctor's note that he needed <laughs> yeah. a night off. And apparently Lewis, you know, wired Joe Glazer, and Glazer's like, do you want me to send another trombone play? <laughs> so Trummy showed up. Um, and then, but one night, Barney Begard didn't show up. You know, he was just too tired, and they had to play without a clarinet player. So the whole band was kind of breaking down. My pet theory, Lewis had a heart attack in Spoleto, Italy, in June of 59. And a lot of people always say, ah, oh, that's the beginning of the end. But when you hear his recordings in 59, 60, even 61, I mean, he's still, the heart attack had no effect on him. This tour had an effect on him. Uh -huh. I, I don't think he was ever quite the same oh. in terms of stamina, and I think this one really did him in. And Velma dying. Well, that too. Yeah, so the beginning of the end for Velma, um, there's an article from January 16th, Para uh, Paralysis Strikes Jazz Vocalist Velma Middleton, and she was in Freetown, Sierra Leone, and made the newspapers. There is a letter that uh, uh, Louis Armstrong wrote to Joe Glazer, panic about how Velma has a stroke. I've never seen anything like this. You have to do something. You have to help her. Uh, but Lewis was real firm in that showbiz tradition of the show must go on. And he, and he got criticized for that. And uh, we have a tape after he got home from tour where he uh, privately with his wife Lucille fought back. And Lewis mm -hmm. said, when my mother died, when my father died, because I didn't, I didn't miss a job. You know? mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, we were sad for Velma, I guess, but there's contracts, there's audiences, there's people. Yeah, he said, I, I got to go out there and perform. At one point, the clipping on the right, it was early February, and if you could read the caption, it actually says Velma had a heart attack. She wasn't paralyzed. She'll be back in a few weeks. I think that was just, uh, you know, trying to not make it that serious. But the end came on February 10th, uh, 1961. They gave Velma's age as 45. I think through some of Maxine's research, she might have been two years younger, correct? Or, or older. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's a little there's a, yeah a little but we, we say she died when she was 44 but yeah. 40 she would have been 44 in september i think that's it yeah, yeah 40 yeah. so 43 um and yeah there's there's all these beautiful tributes you know uh this was in sepia magazine and they did a whole thing in which they actually mentioned in this article that lewis knew her health was not great, and he had offered to pay her six months' salary not to go to Africa, not we, to even go on this tour. That, right? And it's in the article. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But, 
you know, she, she still went, and so this whole article is about her troopers passing. And then the funeral, Lewis was still overseas, uh, but Joe Glazer was able to get the body um, and sent to New York, and they had a big funeral. Over 500 people showed up. And uh, after Lewis returned to New York in March, he gave an interview in which he talked about how uh, he was sending all of Velma's paychecks to her mother, and he said, the checks will keep coming until I run out of money myself. So mm -hmm. I'm sure Velma's family was, was kept on, on the payroll. Um, one thing I realized jumping around, we didn't spend that much time with the maps. We we're going to close oh. with, the, with the newsreel, but let's just go through the maps real Ooh, quick. Yeah, we just showed the map. Just to show... So once again, uh, we'll take them one at a time here. This is the first leg of the tour, which was the second half of October 1960. So you could see kind so of. So we met, okay. Yeah. Well, I'll just show you. So what he did um, in the map division was do it like they came from France and then here's how they traveled in the beginning. And what are the dates? October 12th to October 30th. So that was like the beginning of the tour. And then November. And in November, they went all to this area in Tanzania and, and um, what's now Zimbabwe and, you know, but it was Rhodesia and southern Rhodesia and northern Rhodesia. And the thing about the Congo is very confusing, the, the, what it was called then and now, and now we have Democratic Republic of the Congo, but Leopoldville is King Leopold, right? right of of uh, Belgium, that's like a really bad story. And, you know, but he's there, like in the middle of all, this is the year of Africa. They call it the year of Africa. 17 countries become independent in 1960. And there is Louis Armstrong traveling and playing every night in the midst of all this, what's happening, you know, in Africa. So it's not separate from the history and the timing, that's what I mean about jazz geography. It's not just the itinerary. I mean, we have to think about what's happening in those places and what's happening when they get back. Mm -hmm. Because they're not the same person, they have to come back to the shit here, right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> next. <laughs> so this is November to December when they go to Paris for that month when he makes the film, but then has a gig like every night at the hot club and everything. <laughs> so it's supposed to be a break, which he didn't take. But I mean, look at the travel, you know, all the way down to Mozambique and up and I mean, unbelievable. And then the return. Unbelievable, right? And here's the return. Oh yeah. In January. This was the final leg. And like I said, even from here, when they finished here, after Velma passed and all, they still did a, about a month in Europe. Yeah. Sweden, Germany. Right. Um, I, I believe they went back to England. Uh, so, yeah, Lewis left Corona Queens, his home, in <laughs> early October and didn't return until the beginning of March. Right. And he had teeth problems at, at the end. Oh, he said yeah. the last month he played in pain every night. Uh, Joe Glazer gave him a month off, which was unheard of when he got home because he was really beat up. But here's the complete tour, thanks to okay. our friend uh, Scott Walker. Those are the countries with the names at that time. So, we, you know, we were, went back and forth. And then um, when I was at Radcliffe, I met one of the other fellows who was from Zimbabwe. So I showed her the map, and she was like, oh, yeah, no, you have to get it right for 1960 because, it, you know, it's not, there was no Zimbabwe in 1960. So... You know, that's why my book is not done. <laughs> because I'm very interested in mapping now. <laughs> I'm, you know, the mapping thing has become central to uh, the way I'm thinking about being a musician and about what it means, the road and um, the travel. And, you know, I hadn't put it together that, you know, I was a road manager and so... Even now, if I get on a train in Europe, I'm like, I have serious flashback, okay? <laughs> <laughs> because I was like, oh, I remember when, you know, and Dizzy went to Belgium, and then they, these guys tried to come from the Congo, and the, the, the promoter said, oh, we don't let those people in. And it was, you know, that was in the mm. 70s. And then he said, what, what people? You know, you mean my people? <laughs> mm. And they were like, yeah, but we had this war, and we don't like them. 
And he was like, well, they probably don't like you. And, you know, it was like, so it was in the 70s in, in Brussels. It mm. was the same dis- tension and, you know, it wasn't over. And Dizzy said, it's never over. Mm. He said that, yeah. Well, Maxine, we have about three minutes left, oh. and I, you know, think, I think it's time to close with your, uh, your other surprise. Okay. Why don't you tell the folks about British Pan? Sorry. Anybody wants to email us if you know more about this subject, then, you know, please, we need help. <laughs> you okay, want, do you want to yeah, introduce uh, okay. this? Um, in my research, I um, found that it's silent. It's a newsreel. It's how long? Three minutes. Three minutes. Um, it's about the them, the band in Rhodesia, and it's silent. And you see Velma at the end. So shortly after this, she has a stroke and dies in Africa. So um, the, I, the last it's footage. They're quite yeah. poignant and silent. Okay. But you hear the, you hear that um, newsreel noise, right? Trump of players in Rhodesia, I heard. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder where she got those shoes. <laughs> a trooper's passing. So should we start planning next year? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take and the conversation. I, I want to <laughs> know who made her clothes and where she got the shoes. So that's like, we must know somebody who knows that, right, Jackie? <laughs> we have to find somebody who can figure that out, right? 
<laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Okay, Ricky Riccardi and Maxine Gordon. Thank you. Ricky, of course, will be back at 4 o'clock.